for making time to join us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to see you all here. I know that it can be a bit of a scramble at the end of the day, but I am pretty confident that today's lecture will not disappoint. I am Jack Miles, Professor of English and Director of the UCI Program of Religious Studies. And today I am particularly pleased to be able to introduce as one in the program series of guest lecturers, as well as an illuminations lecturer in the series sponsored by the Humanities Commons, UCI's, come up their seats in front here, folks. Well, uh, UCI's own lively and provocative professor of physics and astronomy, Michael Denon. Professor Denon, who has been at UCI for 18 years, is Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and Dean of our Division of Undergraduate Education. His research focuses on the dynamics of not foams, but foams. Ask him to talk to you sometime about the physics of shaving cream. <laughs> he has won award after award for his teaching as well as his research and is passionate about public outreach in the area of science. Professor Denon has appeared on numerous television programs, including Science of Superman, Spider-Man Tech, Batman Tech, and Star Wars Tech. You can find him in the YouTube series Fascinating Fights, playfully but seriously applying science to the question of who would win if Batman had to fight Spider-Man. <laughs> Today, however, the subject is religion and science, and the occasion is Professor Denon's newly published book, Divine Science, Finding Reason at the Heart of Faith. Let me set the stage for his remarks by asking you a question. Is the world, as established by scientific proof, the only world that really exists? That world is, of course, the only world for whose existence scientific proof does exist itself. However, the claim that the world whose existence is thus established is the only world rests on the premise that the only real evidence is scientific evidence. Yet, if I ask you to provide scientific evidence that the only real evidence is scientific evidence, you will be unable to do so without assuming the truth of what I have asked you to prove. In fact, the thesis that the only real evidence is scientific evidence is not a real thesis. It is what we call in logic a premise. It is not to be proven or disproven. It is the starting point for innumerable investigations <coughs> rather than the conclusion of even one. Now consider another thesis, namely that reality in its fullness includes but is not confined to the world for whose existence scientific proof exists. Like the first thesis, this one is not susceptible to scientific proof. It too is a premise rather than a conclusion. It is another act of faith, faith in the potential of a given premise to mediate fruitful investigation. But now suppose further that you are a working scientist who crosses back and forth, sometimes taking the first premise as his starting point and sometimes the second. Well, while doing your science, you routinely start from the first premise, you routinely seek scientific evidence for any scientific hypothesis that you are seeking to prove or disprove. But now and again, you take the second premise as your starting point. Yet when you do, you don't leave your science entirely behind. No, you bring it with you, and while holding yourself open to the possibility of a fuller reality, you see where your particular cast of mind, the mind of someone with the work habits of a physicist, will take you. This, as I read him, is what Professor Denon has done in his new book, Divine Science, 
Finding Reason at the Heart of Faith, a book that crosses freely and cheerfully and almost nonchalantly back and forth between science and faith as if there were, in fact, no gulf at all between them, no gulf at all. Forty years ago, just out of graduate school, I spent a year as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago, apprenticed to its Committee on the Conceptual Foundations of Science. A few years later, I became philosophy editor of the University of California Press at a time when that publishing house had the philosophy of science as a continuing emphasis. As a result, for better or worse, I have read a few books in this field, and you might, may take my word for it, that this one stands apart for the uniquely experiential flavor of it. That is, for the sense it conveys of a real life of science penetrating and shaping a real life of faith. As I concluded the book, the phrase that came to my mind was one coined by Mahatma Gandhi. This book is what the father of Indian independence would have called an experiment with truth. And with that, please join me in welcoming Michael Bennett. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jack, both for the invitation to speak and now that dangerous introduction that I'll never live up to, but we'll try. <laughs> um, this is an interesting um, chance for me to move into a talk on science and faith. And I specifically thought a little bit about the second word in the talk. I want to say that at the beginning, because it could have been a talk on science and religion, a talk on science and spirituality, a talk on science and faith. And I picked that word to avoid a few things. Religion, to me, I think for many people, connotates a sort of organizational structure and morals and ethics. And really, I don't think there's much on the interest. There can be, but for me, the interest is not science and its impact on moral and ethics. So that's not something I'll be talking about, so I purposely avoided religion. Um, spirituality is, I think, a fuzzier word. And, and you'll see why I picked faith, because I think faith is an often misunderstood word, but that works well with reason. Before I get into the heart of the talk, there are a few elements I need to set. Um, who I am, who I am not, and what I am assuming. Now, many of you know something about who I am, and you know more from the introduction, but in that category, there's two particular things I want to highlight. I am a practicing physicist. That may be diminishing now that I'm a vice provost, but I am still a practicing physicist. I still visit my lab, and I have an active research grant. Um, I study things, pattern formation, complex fluid, biological systems. And loosely, if I want to use fancy words, I study complexity and emergence. What do you need to know about that? A couple of things. One is my focus is on when we get systems together. So if I get a lot of particles together, is there new behavior? Is there new laws of physics that only make sense because I have a lot of particles together? Right? The traditional reductionist view says, as I look smaller and smaller and smaller at a system, I find fundamental laws of physics. And if I know those, that's all I need to know to predict all behavior. Condensed matter physicists like myself, who deal with large, complex systems, say, yes, that's true. Nothing at the higher scale ever violates those fundamental laws. But actually, there are new laws of physics that exist only at certain length scales, energy scales, number of particles. So that's the physicist world I live in. I also bring this up because the physics I'm going to talk about in this talk is fundamentally non-intuitive. So there's a very good chance you won't understand anything I say. <laughs> now, why do I say that? So one of my areas of research early in my career was pattern formation. People would ask me, what do you study? And I say, well, I study whether a particular system exhibits stripes, squares, or hexagons. And they look at me and go, I don't get it. I don't understand. I'm like, what don't you understand in those words? You know what a stripe is? Yes. You know what a square is? Yes. You know what a hexagon is? Yes. I study whether you get one of those three. And it made me realize that most of the time in human experience, there is a difference between understanding and understanding. Right? We can understand the words that are being said and what it means, but we get uncomfortable 
if we don't have an intuitive feel for what it is. And we don't think we understand it because it doesn't align with our intuition. And one of the problems with this talk is I will be talking when I talk about physics mostly about general relativity and quantum mechanics, which are two areas very few of you experience on an intuitive level. So trust me, the words will make sense, and what I'm saying probably really means what you think it means. You will be uncomfortable with it because you don't have an intuitive everyday experience of it. So trust a little bit that it makes sense. The second piece is for full disclosure, I'm a practicing Catholic. My dad's an Irish Catholic, but I have a Jewish mother. Um, so I am an Irish Catholic Russian Jew, which may explain a lot about me. Um, and I do have a Jesuit high school education, and I've continued to be active in my faith exploration. And that's what brought these two areas together eventually in a book. It just was very interesting to me. What I am not is a professional philosopher or a professional theologian. I want to be very clear about that. What does that mean for this talk? I'm on dangerous ground as the person who's currently in charge of academic integrity. Um, this talk is a reflection of my experiences. And it's not necessarily a traditional academic talk. So I am not taking great care to cite other people. The reason is, this talk really is, and Jack said it earlier, it's, a, it's an experiential talk. It's the sum of my experiences, of what I've read, what I've heard, what I've talked about, and to tease out the, to separate those influences as actual like citations is not even possible. So I now cite everybody who's ever influenced me, and I've taken care of that piece. Um, there will be a few citations with quotes. The other thing I mentioned is I am a practicing Catholic, and I think it's important, though most of the talk will have nothing to do with Catholic teaching per se, I happen to know it's all consistent with it, at least I will claim that, but I am coming from a Catholic perspective. That formed me. So if you're Catholic, you quote popes. Um, so Pope John Paul II, faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. Pope Benedict, if faith and reason were to appear to contradict, then you are misinterpreting one or both of them. And this is critical. Pope Benedict did not say, if faith and reason contradict, reason is wrong. Pope Benedict did not say, if faith and reason contradict, faith is wrong says you're misinterpreting one or both of them. They have to work together. Right? You can't just have one or the other, and you don't get to pick. And I, I know the Catholic Church gets a bad rap for Galileo, but I would like to put in a plug. At the time, that was science versus science. Galileo was violating the fundamental well-held science of the time, Aristotelian worldview. And so we see it now as the classic science versus religion debate. But in a little, and, and there was an element of that, not to deny it, but there was a lot of science versus science going on there. And so the Catholic Church really has this tradition of reason that's very strong in it. The other thing I want to comment is when I use the word faith, it's often used as blind acceptance of arbitrary statements. I understand that usage, not my usage. When I talk about faith, it's, it's kind of the experiential version of doing scientific experiments. Not everything is reproducible and replicable and can be done that way, but experience does happen. And we have experiences, and faith is formed out of personal experiences and other people's experiences, and adding reason in, it's a journey. I mean, this I just got somewhere in my life. Almost always in the, what I consider the serious faith reflections, it's always faith journey that's used, never a static point. And, and it's often questions as much as it is answers. And that's important. I hope you understand from this talk as you go through it. I will provide some of what I think are my answers and views. But the point of this talk is not my answers. The point of this talk is I would like to suggest there's some better questions than that normally make the public discourse. That they're more interesting questions. They're questions that I think are fun to engage in and can lead to interesting places. So this talk is really about the questions, not the answers, though I will give a few answers. The other final piece, I think, in the introduction is, realistically, I, you know, I've spent most of my life as a physicist. Um, we may have a small reputation for being an arrogant group of people. I get that sense because people tell me that. <laughs> um, and there's also a sort of group within the religious circles that might be thought of as very arrogant and very rigid. And the reality is the best faith and the best science comes out of humility. 
I mean, science tests, when you think about what we do, it's fundamentally about making sure we understand the limits and what we don't know. Error bars are the most important thing in science, right? Understanding the space of what we don't know. And scientists fundamentally, I think when they're at their best, do approach things with this humility. And the real, true, deep faith journeys are done with humility. After all, they're generally what I would call before the infinite. And when you're faced with concepts like the infinite, it's hard not to be humble. And again, just to give my little plug for Catholicism, despite the whole pope and um, impossible infallibility, the, the catechism of the Catholic Church says very clearly that even though the Catholics believe Christ is the fullness of revelation, our understanding of revelation is not complete. Built into it is a recognition that we don't have a complete understanding of what was revealed. Right? There's a level of humility that is not often put out to the public, but is foundational to the approach. So that's just a little bit of who I am, who I'm not, where I'm coming from, because I want you to have a context. The other thing is, please ask any questions at any point in the talk. This is not a chance to just sit there. Bear in mind, I've given a couple of these. Some of the questions I may have to say don't have time for a very interesting question. It's not I'm trying to ignore you. It's just, seriously, I don't have time for it. Um, but we can talk about it later. What I would like to do is briefly review the assumptions that are behind this and then do what looks like you shouldn't do in a talk. A talk of this length should only have one idea, so I'm going to have three. Um, but there are three examples for the same idea. And the big idea I'm going to be looking at is what Jack referred to in his introduction. What happens, where do you go if you make an assumption that reality is more than just physical reality? So when we look at these assumptions, there's probably more than three, but I'm going to put three up here. One is that physical reality is the only reality. Perfectly valid assumption could very easily be true. What do I mean by physical reality? Physical reality is what you probe with your five senses or instruments built to enhance those senses. It is science. We, science fundamentally probes physical reality, and it does an amazing job at it, and it finds the rules that govern physical reality through experimentation and careful processes. Another assumption you could make is that the Bible is a literal science textbook and the world works the way the Bible does, or your other favorite you know, scriptural source. Um, it is in this space that there is much of the public debate and conflict, and it must exist. I would argue that these two assumptions are fundamentally in opposition, and there is no way really to reconcile them, so it's not surprising that any debate in this space doesn't lead to conclusions. I'm going to start from a different assumption, I'll kind of motivate why, that there is reality beyond and including physical reality. I think the interesting sort of theological question, which I won't really get into in this talk, is if that reality exists, does it actually care about me or not? Right? That's, that's moving more towards what I would call the really traditional Judeo-Christian Islamic understanding of God. God does actually care about you. Um, we're going to focus mostly on just even this assumption of a reality beyond physical reality. To do that, I want to make a couple of comments on that lower left corner, Bible being literal, so you know where I'm coming from. It's, to me, clearly not a science textbook. And this is, I think, something fascinating if you've read it. How do you know it's not a science textbook? Anyone tell me, what are some traditional Greek gods and why do they exist? Name a Greek god and what their job was. Zeus. Zeus. And what was Zeus's job? Throw lightning bolts, another Greek god. You thought you'd just get to sit and listen. You should have known better. <laughs> so Apollo is the sun god. Apollo sun god drags the sun around. Why do we have seasons? Persephone ended up, right, with Hades, the whole bad marriage thing, and then is only let out half the year. Okay? If you look at most early stories involving gods, it was an attempt to explicitly explain the world around you. I can't find a story in the Bible where that's the point of it, right? It was a radically different approach to reality. It was not concerned with explaining where the thunder and lightning came from or who caused it. It's not concerned with who the sun is. It's concerned with different questions. The focus is the nature of God, God's faithfulness to God's people, and God's expectations for how people relate to each other. A very different type of book. And it leads someone like St. Augustine, who I love to quote because of his sentence in blue, 
Um, you know, we're worried about polite language and being nice to each other now. He wrote, it is thus offensive and disgraceful for an unbeliever to hear a Christian talk nonsense about such things, claiming that what he is saying is based in scripture. What is he talking about? Christians going around and saying Genesis explains stuff when it's patently wrong, and the non-Christians knew science. They knew the earth was round, they knew things about it, they knew the size of it. Um, this is in a very funny um, piece that St. Augustine wrote. If you, I don't know, you think of St. Augustine as funny, but on the literal meaning of G Genesis, why you shouldn't take it literally. And there's some great examples about why the science is bad. He does kind of end it with, but if you really need to believe it, I guess that's okay, but you really shouldn't. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's very clear, you know, the view of St. Augustine towards taking the Bible literally. The, the final piece before we go into some examples, why even assume that there's more to reality than physical reality? Why would I do that? And I would argue the, the assumption that only physical reality is real may be correct, but it's the boring assumption. And why do I argue it's the boring assumption? it doesn't necessarily lend itself to being wrong. Right? It doesn't really have built into it as a hypothesis the idea that you could conclude there's more than physical reality. You can do that, you can stretch it, but I think it's much easier to go from the direction of assume the possibility of a non-physical reality, and in the process of exploring this hypothesis or thesis, it's very natural that one of the outcomes would be, nope, only physical reality exists. So as a practical exploration, as a question to ask, I find it much more compelling. But I find it a very, very dangerous question. And the reason is, it is hard to disentangle it from supernatural magic and pseudoscience where you are dealing with what I would call overtly physical effects without physical causes, where it really just is bad science. And a large fraction of what happens in this space is just bad science. It's not what I feel like I'm talking about. Now, I could be wrong. I could be doing bad science, too. But I think there really is a distinction. I hope you'll get the flavor of why I feel what I'm doing is different than what I would call magic or supernatural. And it has to do with how you look at the actual physical reality and what's coming from it. So given that there's a lot of fraud, superstition, and outright error out there, it makes it challenging to ask this question in an effective way. Now, we're going to head into my three examples I mentioned. Because I'd like to take, if you took seriously the idea that there might be non-physical reality, what does that lead to? What options does that create or not create? So the first one is creation. I've chose to focus on Big Bang and the creation of the universe and not evolution. They both get a lot of press. Um, I was just afraid a biologist would show up if I did evolution. So, <laughs> Now, I'm not a cosmologist, but I had a cosmologist look at my slides. So, um, The question we're going to ask in this section is if physics can explain the creation of the universe, why propose the existence of a creator? There are seats in the front, and I don't bite, usually. So many of you know me and know that I'm now in charge of teaching and learning. So you should see this coming. Now you're going to have to talk to your neighbor. Um, so hopefully you sat next to someone you're willing to chat with. And, and I think everyone can do this exercise, even if you don't believe in God, and even if you don't believe God created the universe. If there was a God that created the universe, and you were asked to draw that, that act, God creating the universe, or God as creator of the universe, what would you draw or describe? So talk to the person next to you, or the three people next to you. How do you do? What would you draw, describe for that action? Who, who is willing to share what they would draw or describe? Yes? I think it was a big mess. A big mess. OK, a big mess. Excellent. Yes? I think I would kind of agree that a group would draw a woman giving birth. A woman giving birth, OK. Yes? So it's going to go like this way. Waves. Waves. OK, waves. Excellent. I like it. What else? Well, I would draw a seed because it's the energy within the seed. It's seed the and energy that okay. creates. Let me ask you this. Excellent. Seed. How many of you were unwilling to say it as your example, but at some point in thinking about it, Michelangelo's artwork showed up in your head? <laughs> How many people thought of you know, a god, you know, 
touching Adam or creating the earth or zapping into place. It's an interesting thing. I talk about this subject to high school students and to adults. High school students all immediately go, they draw pictures of like an earth or stars and some human figure. Often an old bearded guy, but not always, right? And, and when I talk to adults, they freeze for a while because they're all trying to think, well, what answer does he want, right? <laughs> and what answer is not going to make me look like I'm thinking of a guy creating an earth? <laughs> but the guy creating the earth is embedded in our idea of creation. What, and not necessarily a guy, maybe a woman too. What are examples of things being created every day? What are creators? Who are examples of people creating stuff? Categories. Artists. Cooks. Musicians. Inventors, right? And what it is, we are fundamentally embedded, when we hear the word creator, we think of a physical person creating a physical object. We think of the physical being interrupting this creation at discrete points in space and time. I make my painting, I look at it, I'm like, oh wait, nope, it's not quite right. I go back and fix it, right? I create my piece of music, I play it. No, that's not right, I go back and tinker with it. And this idea of creator as tinkerer, as magician, as making physical objects separate from themselves is so embedded in our language of creator that it dominates the conversation of God the creator. And I would argue that's exactly the wrong language we want to use, and we're going to come back to the mother giving birth. And, but let's first take our first foray into physics. There will be a quiz at the end, so memorize these numbers. We have creation from the physics view. We understand in physics that there are four fundamental forces. Some of them you're familiar with, gravity, electromagnetism, and then we got run out of words, weak force and strong force, because one was weak, one was strong. Um, at a certain point, at a high enough energy, these are unified. They're a single force. We understand how that works. At some point, they become separate. Really cool, particles develop mass. Recently, how many heard of the Higgs boson being discovered? Right, we understand, that's a, that was a mystery, like where did mass come from? Why do things have different masses? We understand that now. Light dominates the universe, matter dominates. Another cool thing happens, matter and light separate. How many people have heard of the microwave background radiation? Right, a few of you, good. Right, we, we have this signature, this look back into the far past because matter and light separated, they didn't interact, and the microwave radiation continued to propagate, and we can actually look at what the distribution of stuff was in space way back in the past because of this occurrence. We have these great tools because light travels at a finite speed. So when we look far away, we're looking far back in time. So we can measure all of this stuff. The challenge is what comes before all of this stuff. Right? That's a challenge. It's a challenge from a couple of points of view. One is physics and science is fundamentally experimental about measuring, and we can't measure before it started. Um, you can imagine getting ideas from our models or theories, but we face a fundamental challenge. As I mentioned, the two kind of physics I'll talk about is general relativity and quantum mechanics. What do you need to know for this slide? General relativity matters most when space is highly curved or gravity is very large. So if you imagine a balloon that's big and spread out or something like the Earth, let me ask you this, is the Earth flat or round? Why? How? How do you know that? Look out, it's flat out there. You've seen pictures from far away, right? If you look big enough, you realize it's a sphere. But if you do local measurements, it's flat, except for the bumps of the mountains and the valleys, right? So the universe, very similar problem, right? It's very big right now, it's basically flat. But we can project back in time, and we know at one point it was highly curved. And you need general relativity to understand what's going on. It's also highly small. And we talk about the physics of the small, we need quantum mechanics. Um, quantum mechanics and general relativity don't really play nicely together. We're working on that. Right? That's the space where there's active research. Now, this is just one idea, then it's, I'm, I'm not show, showing this now as a definite answer of how it happens, but how might you get a creation of a universe. Well, because I study real foams, which that is a picture of, that's a soap foam, but it's there to make you imagine a quantum foam. What do I mean by that? In quantum mechanics, if we look at the lowest energy state of a system, right? when we think normally about energies and stuff, and we think about the state with nothing there, there's nothing there. In quantum mechanics, at the lowest energy, there are still what we call quantum fluctuations, where particles can be created and destroyed as they fluctuate and bubble around. Think of that mess that someone mentioned, right? A lot of chaotic action on a very small scale. So it's possible 
that as we understand a quantum theory of gravity, which has to do with space and time, that you can literally have a vacuum state of the universe, which you think of as nothing, but what it's actually doing is little bubbles in space and time are being created and destroyed, and if one of them gets big enough, it grows and becomes a universe. Do not quote me that that's the way it happened, <laughs> right? But it is a possibility. What does that mean as we move forward? Okay, one way I could describe this process is we have this vacuum state, which is, again, the word you want to understand there is it's the lowest energy. There's nothing really there, but there are these fluctuations. So there's these quantum fluctuations. One of them gets big enough, and you get a universe. Now, the vacuum state is described by the wave function. And I will argue as we go forward, this is an example of non-physical reality. Why? Because the wave function you can never measure directly with physical tests. You always measure the wave function indirectly by what it predicts. But the universe you get out is physical reality. Another view of this, um, physicists, we do like to study spherical cows. No one ever gets that joke, but I throw it out there. Um, we don't like cows with legs and horns and lots of structure. So there is the fullness of reality, a circle. Down in this corner, not here yet, physical reality. So what happens, we repeat what I put up earlier. Unified forces, separation of forces, particles develop mass, light dominates. Or we might switch to the Bible and quote, formless waste, darkness, light separate. And a really bad PowerPoint animation later, we step through these things and physical reality just keeps getting bigger. We get the formation of Earth at 9 billion years and dry land. So we can put these two stories next to each other. And what do we notice? Well, the first thing that most people notice and point out is like, ha ha, the Bible says seven days and it's nine billion years. Well, again, it's not a science textbook. We don't get the sun and earth until day four in the Bible story. So it's unlikely they're talking about 24 hour days because that's not even possible until day four, <laughs> right? And part of it is we've lost a little bit of our sense of being storytellers. This is a story. And the question is, what is the point of this story? One of the points, if you look at it closely, is that structure comes out of uniformity, or order comes out of chaos. That is a piece of it. And that piece is in the scientific process as well. Right? That is similar. More importantly, why a creation story? Well, we have now the scientific theory that explains the rules of the universe. It starts small. It's been expanding ever since. Possibly, depending on how you understand the beginning of it, there may be more than one universe. You look at the Bible story, you get God created everything. God, if you read into it, maybe I'm reading too much, created a reality that obeys rules. We finally figured out some of those rules. The big thing in the Bible story is at the end of each day, God says it's good. So I want you to imagine yourself back when that oral story was first started. Right? You're probably hungry. You're probably sick. Right? You're worried about things eating you. Um, disease is rampant, you might have some fire, maybe you're a hunter-gatherer, maybe you've made it to a little bit of farming and shepherding, right? And some idiot walks into your group and says, I've just had a revelation, creation is good. And, and they tell you a story to explain that creation is good. This is just radical. We don't see the radicalness of that, we worry about the science, we don't see the radicalness of the storytelling. And I asked high school students this once, what do you think happened to the person who came into this group and said creation is good? And the high school students said they stoned them. <laughs> you know, because that doesn't match that current experience. It's radical, it's new. So I would propose, how do we want to approach this then? The challenge is partly language. The challenge is how we define creator. So let's redefine creation and have a different metaphor. Now please, this is a metaphor, so there will be parts that don't work perfectly. I know there needs to be a father to make a child, okay? But let's ignore that for the metaphor. So physical reality is the child or the fetus in the mother's womb. Starts as a single small object. Constant growth and differentiation. Each state follows a consistent set of rules. If you are a teeny tiny scientist inside the baby trying to do experiments, you can discover all the rules of the baby. Very hard to discover the rules that the mother's there, right? A different process. So this pro proposition that there is a fullness of reality that goes beyond the physical reality raises the question of how do you discover that? How do you explore it? How do you measure it? But doesn't mean it's not there. 
And it's really cool because you have this interesting philosophical challenge. Is the fetus part of the mother? Is it separate? You know, is there full reality? And you get to ask nice questions about, is God all of reality? Or is there any reality that's actually separate from God? It's a metaphor in space in which interesting questions arise. All creation flows from the mother, and there are rules embedded in creation that creation follows. So I think this is an interesting twist and a better metaphor and way to think about creation to ask the questions about science and faith. And so to answer my first question, why would you propose a creator when science can explain the physical laws of the physical creation we see? Well, it's not needed per se, and it may not exist. But it is possible that it provides one explanation of the meaning of and behind creation. Creation is good, for example. That's one possible reason for it. It also, if you start with the idea of creation or creator as the fullness of reality, this idea of the mother and the child in the womb, you have a framework in which to think about a seamless integration of faith and physics. So it achieves that for us. Now, we move on to an easy topic, free will. <laughs> now that we've done the hard one. So this I find, I put it as my middle idea because I really think it's really pivotal. It's, it's fine and easy for me to say, oh, maybe there's non-physical reality. And it could be just a useless proposition if there's no way to actually study or ask questions about it. So how might we approach it? And I think free will is an interesting direction to start asking, what is the evidence for non-physical reality? And since at the moment, science, which is awesome, is based on physical exploration, what does it mean to study non-physical reality? What does that even mean? But in general, do people feel that there's moments where they had a real choice? Yes. yes. And in fact, our whole society seems to be based on this, right? We actually expect there to be consequences. We send you to prison if you make bad choices, right? And then the university is full of telling students they've made good or bad choices, right? That's what we're about, is choice. And so I really view free will to me, like a lot of people spend time arguing, does God exist or not? I think the way more fascinating question is, does free will exist or not? Right? It's, it's the central question. You've got to somehow figure out how to answer that question before you even worry about does God exist or not, in my mind. And one of the challenges for this for me is I've really struggled with, I don't think I could come up with a scientific definition of free will. It falls into the category of I think I know what it is. I can use the words a real true choice. But I couldn't really tell you what that means. I can tell you what it's not. Right? It's not that there's some process in my brain that is randomly selecting between A and B and it looks like I made a choice. Right? That's not true choice. Right? There's some sense we have that we have a real choice. Which then raises the question, what would it mean to test for it? So I come down very differently for consciousness. Right? If you think about consciousness and I'm myself aware, I kind of believe that that's not unique to people. I think we'll eventually make cute computers that are self-aware. Right? And you can probably test whether things are self-aware or not, and there's probably a real physics underlying understanding of being self-aware. I'm really stuck on whether or not you can test for free will or not. I do think, you know, I, and, and there are people who do this professionally, so they may argue with me, I would contend that any interesting book I've ever read, or any truly interesting story, at somewhere in it was the question of, do we have free will or are things faded? Right? It may be about other stuff too, but at the end of the day, that's what we worry about. Do we have any control over our life? Now, physics would suggest we have none. Okay? And I will say why real quickly. So classical mechanics is the easy one. That's the studying of you people in the room and balls and inclined planes. And classical mechanics is easy. You know the initial conditions. Everything else follows. We call it determinism. You have no free will. Um, People say, oh, well, what about chaos, right? They hear about chaos and they get all excited because things are unpredictable. Well, no, nope, sorry. Um, everything is still completely determined and deterministic. The only difference is that some systems are very sensitive to the initial condition. So if you don't quite measure it right, your predictions fail after a certain amount of time. Not because they're not deterministic and it's not following a set route. The system's not actually doing anything truly random. You just are unable to predict it. That's different than having choice. Now, we pull in quantum mechanics. Well, maybe that's our way out. And I, and I wish, this is one place where I wish I could remember who said it so I can give them credit. But I once heard someone say, just because quantum mechanics is confusing, it doesn't explain everything that's confusing. <laughs> um, so, 
to get this way with quantum mechanics, we have to understand what we mean by the state of something. So how would you describe the state of the room right now? Anyone, just shout out things that describe the state of the room. Cool. Bunch of people in it. What else? Comfortable. Oh, comfortable. Good. <laughs> what are the people doing? Are they moving or not moving? Not moving. Mostly not moving. You're sitting. You know, we talk about the things we're measuring with our senses. Right? The common way to describe the state of something in classical mechanics, which is the study of what we're doing, is to measure physical reality and describe the position, the velocity, the acceleration, the energy, the momentum, the angular momentum, how you're spinning, the charge. And that gives you the state of the system. So when I say the state of the system, and I'm talking about traditional classical physics, that's all I'm talking about. Look around, measure, and you've got the state. Why is quantum mechanics weird? Many reasons, but one is the state of the system is described by the wave function, which is inherently non-physical. We don't ever measure the wave function. It helps that we write it as a complex number, so you get to use i, the square root of minus 1, which my wonderful daughter, who is not following in my footsteps, once asked me, Dad, what's up with these invisible numbers as opposed to imaginary numbers? But we worked on that. So not everything is genetic. But you take this non-physical wave function, and it does two things for you. It predicts allowed values for and the probability of measuring all these things that were before the physical state of the system. So this is a radically new world view, right? I, my state is this wave function. That is the state of the system. It allows me to predict what used to be the state of the system, but is now what I'm measuring. Now, if I measure enough things, there's special ways to tell me what the wave function will be after I measure it. The wave function itself, completely deterministic. It changes in time in a way that has no randomness whatsoever. The act of measurement, we don't completely understand. There is a probability there that goes on. But I still would argue it doesn't meet my criteria of real choice. Right? We have a non-physical entity. We have experiments that suggest the wave function really is real, not a mathematical tool. There are places in physics where we use complex numbers as a mathematical tool. It does only predict probabilities for measurements, but I would argue this is not choice. It may be a space in which choice can exist, but it's not fundamentally choice itself. Right? If I take quantum mechanics seriously, there's no place in which you make a choice. Right? A measurement happens and you either get A or B and you're stuck with it. So we're in a situation with free will that, as far as I can tell, and I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, physical reality leaves no room for free will. So if we start with the assumption that physical reality is the only reality, we don't have free will. Our, our deep experience could be wrong, but is that free will exists somehow. And a fuller reality, a non-physical reality, call it what you will, call it God, soul, spirit, that we also participate in, is perhaps where free will exists. And that's where you go back to the storytelling in the Bible, and you have these stories, for instance, of Adam being created and Eve with the breath of God being added, right? The storytellers combine both physical reality with a non-physical reality, because that is the space in which choice exists. Now, quantum mechanics is a cool thing because it has a non-physical reality piece to it that may be a space in which free will occurs, but at the moment, our understanding of it, I would argue, doesn't conclusively point to it. So I really feel if somehow you could develop a sense of whether or not you can show free will exists or not, that to me is the interesting question that's the entree into, is my assumption possibly real? It seems to be one of the few ways you can get at this as more than an assumption. But I need to challenge you here for a moment. Um, shout out characteristics of Scrooge or the Grinch, whichever character you're familiar with. Mean. Mean. Selfish. Stingy. <laughs> Selfish. Misunderstood. Rich. What? Rich. Rich. Green. Green. Sad. Sad. <laughs> if, uh, see, you spoke too soon there. <laughs> if you actually read the stories or saw the animated classic, Scrooge at the end is described as no man in the city kept Christmas better and kept it all year round. Um, Grinch has just told us his heart grew three sizes and embraced love and the true meaning of Christmas. So w you all argued that we have this deep understanding that free will must exist. And yet, what does it say that our society and its fundamental stories focuses on no change? 
right? Two of the most major characters in literature that underwent radical transformation, and we do not accept that. We insist that they're mean, grouchy, and all of those horrible things, and stingy. Um, well, I'll just leave it at that. So I want to take a few, you know, I, and this is, Jack asked me to do this, and I have no, I, I'm very excited to attempt to do my little piece on life after life. Right, because the other hard thing, heck, we did free will, why not do life after death? But I'm a more positive person, it's life after life. Um, so is there any way to understand life after life in a scientific worldview? And I think, first of all, like with Creator, we need to shed some of our imagery of it, if we're going to have a reasonable discussion of it. I'm not worried about angels, you know, clouds paved with gold. I mean, it would be nice to have some gold. But, you know, I mean, you know, what I'm interested in is what is the implication, if there's a fuller reality, for our understanding of the self after the physical body stops? So obviously, if our assumption that there's only physical reality is correct, then it's unlikely that there's anything after death, because your physical reality is done doing anything, right? And that, that's a reasonable thing. But what most faiths, when you really dig down behind the imagery, are focusing on is what happens to the self. And is there a space in which to have this conversation? So I'm going to draw an analogy here. This is a physics analogy. I have an electron and a positron. A positron is antimatter. It's the opposite of an electron. Antimatter, though it sounds very science fiction-y, very simple. Electron has a negative charge and a whole bunch of other properties. The anti-electron or the positron has a positive charge and all the other same properties. So it's an electron with a positive charge. Nothing really mysterious. They can annihilate and produce two photons, fancy word for two particles of light. So beforehand, I have two particles with mass. One has a negative charge, one has a positive charge. Afterwards, I have two massless particles. Their photons don't have mass, um, and they go off and do their thing. Now, in a sense, the wave function is the same through this whole process, right? The wave function just kind of is something, it, what it predicts changes. So it's a little bit of where language fails at times. Language is finite, and I'm talking about something a little um, complicated. In one sense, the wave function changes because it has different values. It'll predict different things. But it is still the wave function of the system. And there are pieces that we call are conserved. So remember, I said the wave function predicts what you might measure. So beforehand, the wave function will tell you, well, you, if you're going to measure for electrons, you'll measure one of them. If you're going to measure for positrons, you'll measure one. If you're going to measure for photons, you'll get zero. And for charge, you'll get zero. Afterwards, if you measure for electrons, you'll get zero. Positron zero, photons one, but you're still going to get zero for charge. Charge is conserved in this process. And it really makes most sense from a quantum mechanics perspective in my mind. I mean, yes, charge is conserved even in classical mechanics. But you're really looking at the wave function, its evolution, and which pieces of it stay the same as you measure stuff. So as an analogy, think about before and after death. Before you have an active physical body, after you have an inactive physical body. Now, it could be, we don't know really how to do the wave function of something quite this complicated, and it may not even make sense anymore. And I really want to emphasize, this is an analogy. Even at this level, it's still an analogy. I'm just pointing out how thinking about the non-physical points to directions to think. So I'm not saying this is fact. And hopefully that got recorded really well so anyone who watches this <laughs> understands that. So beforehand, you could imagine asking measurements. Do you have an active body? Yes, you're going to get that with a probability of one. Do you have a self? Yes. Afterwards, do you have an active body? Nope. But do you have a self? Yes. Um, so it points to a direction to think and ask questions about. So really, the answer to this question is just more questions. You know, is it at all reasonable to think about the self as a quantity that's conserved during a transition or transformation? And if it is, is it reasonable to think about it as a conserved quantity of the wave function that's somehow part of our standard physical measurements, but somehow different, too? Or is this just an analogy and points how things might work? The wave function isn't at all relevant to this process. We're just using it as an analogy. But there is some other aspect of non-physical reality that's relevant. And how would you get there? So more questions than answers. But it's, I think what it shows is it creates a space in which to think about what it is you're actually trying to show, and is there a place in which science can make 
comments on that or not? Or do we need to look at a different way of learning about reality in the universe? Because I, I, I claim I have time, and you're stuck in the seats at the moment, you can't disagree, I want to quickly throw in a bonus question. Um, because I think it has an interesting challenge. Right? If you notice, I've explicitly looked at life after death, and now I'm going to claim miracles. Two things that are most often avoided in a public discussion, right? the focus is on evolution and creation. Because the focus, I think, is very misplaced. It's on this idea of God as magical creator. Not a useful idea in my mind. Right? Once you start asking about a non-physical reality, part of a fuller reality that physical reality is part about, you have to think about miracles very differently, I would argue. And what you're doing is removing the idea of a magical being. You're moving to an idea, and again, if I think about the biblical language around miracles, I'm not going to say they didn't happen. Something happened to people who then had to communicate it. And what was their language of communication? The language they wrote the stories in. You have to take that seriously. If you don't take seriously the storytelling aspect of it, right, and what surprises the people, and let me give you an example, the story of Noah's Ark. We look at that and laugh at the science, right? You couldn't fit all the animals in an ark, and the lions would eat the deer, and we'd all be dead, right? <laughs> it doesn't float. It falls apart. But where was that story coming from? It was coming from a world where you all lived near rivers that flooded regularly, right? Often they flooded worse than they should, and the world was wiped out. And the standard view was, a god must have punished us for that. Somebody now tells a different story of that. They tell the story of a flood, looks like God's punishing people, but at the end, God says, I will never do this again. That is my promise to you. I will not use nature to punish. That is not the type of God I am. We forget that last little piece of the story, which was the surprising part to the listeners. Right? They're thinking they're getting a standard God wiping us out flood story. They're all excited. They're ready for it. And there's this twist at the end. You know, we look at it and we focus in on is it scientific or not. And we forget the storytelling aspect. So I would argue that these are meant to point us to radical transformation. So let's jump to Jesus' miracles, which often get a lot of press. Feeding people, healing people, being in harmony with nature, and extreme nonviolence I'm actually putting as a miracle. We don't often list that as a miracle, but I think we can say that it is. And uh, uh, my one Bible quote for you um, in the Gospel of John, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Sorry, I quoted an actual version. That's why there's just he's there. So are we ready for this? Right? We already noticed that we took the Grinch and Scrooge and we weren't ready for choice, right? But are we ready for a world where we actually do end hunger, right? Mathematically, we know we can do it. We have a Blum Center for the alleviation of poverty, right? We know what it would take, but do we have the will to do it? Can we make that miracle happen? I sound like I'm quoting, I, I won't even tell you what movie. Um, <laughs> basic health care for all. See the natural world as something to work with and not to control or exploit out of fear. And the really big one, end war. Right? These, that, the, the challenge of the miracles is not did it happen that way and can science explain it. The challenge of the miracles are you really willing to transform, execute your free will and do this. So I would like to just make two, four final comments. I think ultimately, for me, what's much more interesting, whether you're a theist or an atheist or an agnostic, the question that fascinates me is what's the fundamental nature of reality? And that's a place with a lot of interesting dialogue. I gave you my thoughts. I gave you where I am. I don't expect these to be my thoughts in 10 years. You know, it's an interesting discussion. Um, in this space, I think there's interesting questions and dialogue. Uh, I do want to point out, I think it's very clear when you think about it more from this perspective that there are definitions and understanding of God that are just not compatible with our current best understanding of physical reality. Look, we got rid of Apollo the sun god. There are other aspects and views of God that are you know, promoted out there that people have to recognize are not serious. And St. Augustine will remind you that it's embarrassing and offensive and not to do it. Um, and Pope Benedict reaffirmed this. When faith and reason contradict, you've got to look at both. On the other side, I think it's important to be very clear that just because you have a physical explanation of physical phenomena does not logically preclude the existence of fuller reality. It might be true that all that exists is physical reality, but it's not a proof that because you can explain something, that something else doesn't exist. 
So there are definitions and understandings of God that are consistent with our best understanding of science, and that's a space to work in. So thank you again to all those people that impacted this talk that I didn't cite. Normally this would be the people I thank. And the founding agency, nobody funded me for this, so I can't you know, thank any funding agencies. <laughs> but I will do crass advertisement. I have books with me. And they are for sale, and I do sign them. <laughs> thank you for your time.